Well, we're in the uh, fourth week of our Advent series on the journey to Christmas. I read this week uh, that Canadians spend $6.6 billion on their pets last year. 55% of all Canadians own a pet. Cat, dog, fish, lizard, hedgehogs. And not one word of thanks from any of them for all the money that's spent on them. We walk them, clean up after them, vacuum the hair off the couch, clean the tank, apologize to the neighbors when necessary. Actually, my aunt never even walked her dog. She pushed it around in a stroller. But we love our pets. In fact, some people love their pets more than they love people. Love is the most powerful force on earth. What would a marriage be without love? What would a family be without love? What would the church be without love? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, Without love, I'm nothing, I gain nothing, I'm an empty shell, he says, without love. The interesting thing about the promises of Christmas is that God promises what the world needs and doesn't have. A few weeks ago we talked about the promise of hope. Then we talked about the promise of peace. Then we talked last week about the promise of joy. And this morning we're talking about the promise of love. The world doesn't know much about love, does it? There's a lot of hate in the world, a lot of anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, a lot of vengeance in the world, revenge, a lot of fighting and violence and conflict and arguing and judgmentalism and jealousy and competition and condemnation and cynicism and negativity. Nobody trusts anybody in the world. There's just not much love. James boils down the cause of all fights, all conflicts, all wars to just one thing in James chapter 4 verse 1. He asks a question. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Then he answers his own questions. Is it not this? That your passions are at war within you. Then he explains what that means. You desire and you do not have. So you murder people. You covet and you cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. There's the causes of all quarrels and all conflicts. Somebody wants something and can't get it. You desire and you do not have. You covet and you cannot obtain. Somebody wants something and is demanding something and they can't get it. Love is the opposite of desiring and coveting and demanding and craving for self-interest. Here's what love is. Love gives up demanding for self and gives out of interest for another person. A lot of families with no love. A lot of marriages, unfortunately, with no love. Churches sometimes have no love because somebody's desiring and coveting and demanding something that they can't get. So, let's talk about love this morning. Turn to John chapter 3, verse 16. Um, I suppose no different than most other Christians. I love the Christmas season, but it's always seemed to me that 
that the Christmas season and, and what the Christmas season represents and the, the worship and the gratitude that, that Christmas stimulates in the life of a Christian ought to be no different than it is 364 other days of the year. It's, it's always seemed to me that, that Christmas really, its greatest contribution in our culture is its evangelistic possibilities. That there's no other time of the year not Easter, no other time of the year when a secular world goes shopping and, and is actually hearing deep theology being piped through music over its sound system in the stores. I mean, uh, Christmas is just a fantastic um, opportunity for evangelism like no other time of the year. It's always seemed to me that that's the great uh, contribution that Christmas makes so in spirit of that, let's look at John 3.16. This is the most recognizable, best known, most memorized, most cherished verse in the whole Bible. And it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, I've got a very, very simple outline for you this morning. Here's the first point. Number one, God loves you. That's very clear from the text. For God so loved the world. John 3.16 is embedded in a conversation that the Lord Jesus is having with a fella by the name of Nicodemus. I used to think Nicodemus was Irish because I thought his name was pronounced Nicodemus. Um, Nicodemus was a religious Jewish leader. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And Jesus calls him in John chapter 3 the teacher of Israel. So he's a leader of leaders, a teacher of teachers. And when he hears Jesus say, for God so loved the world. Nicodemus would have been shell-shocked to hear that, stunned. The Teutonic plates of Nicodemus's life would have shifted right here because Nicodemus is a racist. Actually, first, he's a hypocrite because Jesus called all the Pharisees hypocrites. Because the Pharisees thought the Jewish people were the elite people group of the world, the superior race, the only race worthy of going to heaven. The Jewish people of that day hated Gentiles, Samaritans, at least the Pharisee spiritual religious elite did. They hated the foreign nations all around them. They hated the Romans who were living among them. And Nicodemus hated the world because he thought God hated the world. And here, for the first time in his life, he's being informed that that's not true. God loves humanity. He loves all humanity, for God so loved the world. God loves every continent. God loves every nation. God loves every city. God loves every people group in the world. The reason that God sent His Son into an evil, dark world that first Christmas and offers joy and peace and hope and the promise of heaven forever is because God actually loves the world. For God so loved the world. Now God's love shows up across the world in common grace. All of us see it all the time. For example, Jesus said the gospel will be preached all over the world before Jesus returns. 
And that was said, remember, at a time when traveling from Jerusalem to Galilee in the northern part of Israel, a distance of about 60 miles happened on horseback or donkey, and it took a couple of days. Today, the gospel beams by satellite all over the globe. I remember in the 1990s, the first time a Billy Graham crusade was linked by satellite to host facilities all over the world and the gospel for the first time was literally preached simultaneously all over the world. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun rises on the just and the unjust. That's God's common grace. Another example is the, the very ability to experience love. That's an expression of God's common grace. People fall in love and they enjoy that experience of falling in love. Not only believers fall in love, all believers obviously fall in love too. All believers love their children and experience that love. People love the beauties of life and art and music and the majesty of the Rocky Mountains and waterfalls, glaciers, caves and grass and flowers and trees. Those are all evidence that God has a general love for all humanity. But beyond common grace, there is a special love that God has for his own children in the world. And they're all over the world. In fact, heaven is populated by people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and ethnicity um, not just Israel. God loves you. He loves you no matter how much you've blown it. He loves you no matter how many mistakes you've made. He loves you no matter how unloved or lonely you feel. He loves you no matter how rejected you feel. He loves you no matter how anxious you are. He loves you no matter how useless Satan has made you feel. This is the most liberating news in the world for somebody who's been beaten down by life, who's been rejected or left behind, who's been used, misused, or abused. God loves you. I love that old hymn, the love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It doesn't get any simpler or plainer than that. And it also does not get any more profound than that. For God so loved the world. God loves you. Here's a second simple point I want to draw to your attention. God proved that he loves you. Because you see, a lot of people aren't satisfied with that statement that God loves you. A lot of people say, well, that's okay for you, but I don't feel like God loves me, so I'm not sure that God loves me. So Jesus understands that, and he goes on, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This phrase is entirely necessary because it's not sufficient to say God loves you. Because people say that all the time. They say things all the time that they don't mean that are not true. They're called empty words, meaningless words. A lot of blah, 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 blah. Many a person has said, I love you, to a spouse. And then said and done mean and destructive and even monstrous things that is the antithesis of love. I've known people like that. That's what you call fake love. Real love proves itself. Real love will be self-evident. And Jesus knows the need to back up such a radical assertion that God loves the world, especially to a racist. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's the undeniable proof of his love for humanity. This is the hinge 
on which a victorious Christian life swings. When it says he gave, it means he gave him up as a sacrifice to die on a cross. Same thing Isaiah meant when he said, unto us a child is born, a son is, what? Given. Given. 33 years separates those two phrases. God loves, God gave. Those two are inseparable. Giving is the proof of loving. When you love, you give. That's always the proof of love. You give up your own desires, your own demands, your own wants, your own needs. And you give whatever you have to give to the other person in order to advance their interests and what they need. Sometimes what looks like an expression of love is really an attempt to get something for yourself. It's easy to say, I love you. It's another thing entirely to prove it, to demonstrate it, to show it. So Jesus doesn't just say, God loves you. He proves it. He gave his only begotten son. That word begotten means one and only. Paul, uh, incidentally, was talking about this in Sunday school this morning. The word begotten means one of a kind, unique, the one and only. It's a, it's a beautiful word to describe the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus is one of a kind. He's the Son of God. Nobody else in the world ever has been like Him before or since. He's the only God-man who has ever existed. He's incomparable. He's indescribable. He's, he's indestructible. He's magnificent, majestic, beautiful, beyond description. I love those words in that song by the Gettys. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. God isn't giving away some minor gift here that matters little and that doesn't cost much and is of no consequence. God the Father is giving away that which matters more to the Father than anything else in the universe. Back in the Old Testament, God used Abraham to serve as a human illustration of what John 3.16 means. God gave Abraham a son when he was a hundred years old by the name of Isaac. And then in Genesis 22, God says to Abraham, I want you to take your boy, your only boy, the boy that you love, and I want you to give him to me as a sacrifice. Let me see if you really love me, prove it. That's got to be the greatest example of human suffering in the Bible, more so even than Job, to voluntarily give up your boy. Only a spiritual giant like Abraham could have done that. But that's exactly what God the Father did. That's why we worship a triune God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, all one God. Yet the Son and the Spirit do the Father's will. And they all love one another perfectly. And they all have these magnificent, beautiful, different, and unique functions. It's the Father's wrath 
that needs to be satisfied. It's the Son who pays the penalty to satisfy the Father's wrath. And it's the Spirit who takes up residence inside every believer, strengthening and equipping and providing the love, joy, and peace of the fruit of the Spirit. God proves that He loves you. He gave His beautiful one and only Son. Romans 5.8 says that. But God demonstrates His love, proves His love, evidence His love this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how you know that He loves you. You don't ever need to question ever again whether God loves you. He gave His one and only begotten, unique Son, one of a kind Son, to die for you. If that isn't enough, what more could God the Father ever do to prove to you that He loves you? God loves you. God proves that He loves you. That just leaves one more observation. God's love is accessed by faith. Look what the text says. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him. Whoever believes sounds so simple, does it not? Nicodemus would have said to himself right there, it cannot be that simple. I mean, Nicodemus has dedicated his entire life to keeping this meticulous set of commands and rules and regulations that were written by men in order to get to heaven. And here Jesus says, just believe. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot earn heaven. And you never ever will deserve heaven. Jesus has just told him in verse 3 of John 3. You have to be born again in order to get to heaven. That means spiritual birth is somehow like physical birth. And it's like physical birth in a sense. You contribute as much to get to heaven as you contributed to your own birth, which was nothing. Everything at your physical birth was done for you and to you. You were just there. Everything was done for you. And that's how you get to heaven. Everything is done for you and to you. All you have to do is believe in the Son of God, that He is God, that He died for your sins, that He is worthy of your worship, and He is worthy of your obedience for the rest of your life. All you have to do is believe that. But, that's not so simple as it sounds. In fact, it's impossible to believe without help. I know a lot of people who can't believe. In fact, I even know some who say they would like to believe, but they just can't believe. Most of them do not realize that they cannot believe. They think it's their choice to not believe. But Scripture says they cannot believe without help. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that. The natural man, that's the unbelieving person, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. You all understand that, right? You all know people who think the Bible is foolish. But then it says this, he is not able to understand them. It doesn't say he will not understand them. It says he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You cannot believe in Christ without God's help. Furthermore, a lot of people think they're believing. 
when they're really not. James 2.19 says the demons believe in God and they tremble. So simply believing that there is a God and simply believing that Jesus is real puts you on the same level as the demons. But at least they tremble in the presence of holiness. There is a big difference between intellectual assent and real belief. It's like the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. A lot of people say they believe in something, but they really don't. Like somebody who says, I believe that airplanes are safe, but they won't actually step onto a plane. Real belief always translates into action and behavioral change. Belief and obedience in Scripture are synonymous. John 3.36, Jesus says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. So belief and obedience are synonymous. Now, three things happen when you really believe, when you obediently believe. Number one, Real belief removes eternal danger. Look what the text says. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. And the wages of sin is death. Physical death and eternal death. And everybody who sins and doesn't get that sin dealt with is destined to an eternity in hell and outer darkness, a place of relational isolation. I've had people tell me many times over the years, I want to go to hell because all my friends are there. And I say to them, that may be true, but you'll never know. Because you will never see or talk to or communicate with another human being ever again for all eternity in hell. Most horrific environment imaginable to the human imagination. But real belief makes all of that disappear. A few months ago, Jocelyn got a parking ticket downtown, cost her a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, she also, for good measure, got her car towed that day. And for good measure, she paid a lot of money to get that tow pad and also to get it out of the pound. So she went to court to stand before the judge to try to explain herself. I went with her that day, and the judge listened to her little explanation, said she didn't see the sign. And then she, the judge said, You've already paid a lot of money for your mistake. And then the judge said, I've done the same thing myself. I've had my car towed a few times. And I know what it feels like. And she looked at Jocelyn and said, You will never do that again, will you? And Jocelyn said, No, ma'am. And then the judge said those magic words. Your parking ticket fine is dismissed. Dropped. Scrubbed. That's what happens when you trust Christ. All that eternal danger is dismissed. It goes away. Then notice the second thing that happens when you believe. Jesus says, Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life in heaven. That's what you get when you believe. Why? Because God loves you. Life is short. That's what makes funerals so painful. I mean, if I lived to three or four hundred years old, my kids wouldn't be crying at my funeral. They'd be saying, wow, it's about time. <laughs> but heaven is real. And heaven is billions and billions and billions of years long. And heaven is what gives this life purpose. There is no greater way to live than to be ready to die. 
And the way to be ready to die is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a third thing that happens when you die, when you believe. God's love flows through you. When God's love hits you, it's like an electric current. It flows through you and out of you in your words, in your actions, and motives. Look down a couple of verses past verse 16 at verse 20. Jesus says this. For everybody who does wicked things hates the light. See, there is a connection, there's a relationship between your behavior and what you believe about the light. And they do not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. Verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light. The light is the Lord Jesus Christ. So that it may be clearly seen that his works, his behavior, his words, his attitudes, the way he conducts himself or herself in the world, their works have been carried out in God. In other words, God's power and God's love is channeling out through anybody's life who understands that God loves them, understands that God has proved His love for them and has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Good works, behavioral transformation will be the result of belief. My dad used to fill up a 40-gallon drum with water, and he had it in our backyard when I was a kid. And, and I can remember how he would suspend a, a sack filled with cow manure in burlap sack in the water. And, of course, the manure in the burlap sack would seep out into the water and, and would produce 40 gallons of liquid manure. And he had a wee tap on the bottom of the drum and he would turn on the tap and liquid manure would pour out of the tap into the water jug and he would water his roses with this stuff. The lesson, of course, was that whatever is on the inside is what will come out when you turn on the tap. What goes in must come out. Jesus said that. Whatever is in the heart is what will come out of the mouth. If there is hate and unbelief and cynicism in the heart, that's what will come out of the mouth. If God's love is in the heart, that will overflow and come out in your words, in your attitudes, and your outlook on life, and your behavior, and the way you relate to people. When God's love is in you, it will flow through you, and you will love by giving You'll give to your spouse. You'll give to your children. You'll give to your neighbor. You'll give to the person who annoys you. You'll give to your boss, your co-worker. Believe it or not, Jesus said you'll even give to your enemy. You'll pray for your enemy. You will do good to your enemy. That's the power of God's love. So before you respond to another person by being contrary, argumentative, disagreeable, angry, annoyed, uh, negative, Ask yourself this one question. Am I being loving? Am I doing what is best for the other person? 
Or am I attempting to demand and desire and crave some unmet need inside of me? This Christmas, if you don't know the love of God, what greater way to process this Christmas than to ask God to help you to believe in Christ, to believe that He loves you, to believe that He proved His love for you. I promise you this, there is no greater way to process Christmas than to discover the love of God for your life. Let's pray. Father, <coughs> thank you for your great love for the world. Thank you for your great love for all humanity. Lord, this old world of ours is full of hate and evil and desperately needs love. Thank you for giving the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us. What great love. Thank you for giving us faith to believe. Thank you for taking away the danger of hell and for giving us heaven. Help us to let your love flow through us to those who need our love. Lord, if there is someone here today who does not know Christ, give them faith to believe, please. Give them faith to reach out to you today that Christmas of 2017 that they may discover the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.